Good morning. Welcome to Grace Bible Church Equipping Hour. My name is David Britton. This morning we'll be talking about fostering faithfulness, celebrating and considering outreach opportunities for children in foster care. Just wanted to talk about that title a bit and kind of give a trajectory of where we're going today before we ask the Lord's help together in prayer. But fostering faithfulness, you could think about that phrase in two different ways. Kind of like drinking water. Are you talking about an act that somebody is doing? Uh, Drinking? Or are you talking about uh, the water? Fostering faithfulness. In a sense, every, every equipping hour is about fostering faithfulness. If you think about synonyms for the word fostering, nurturing, encouraging, promoting, caring for, cultivating faithfulness, stimulating faithfulness in our life as Christians, fostering faithfulness. And I hope that this equipping hour does encourage you to foster faithfulness in your own life unto the Lord in whatever aspect that God gives you an opportunity to honor him, to glorify him. But in another sense, we're talking about fostering as in foster care and the caring that is going on already here at Grace Bible Church and opportunities to excel still more. So it has a dual meaning, fostering faithfulness. Today we want to celebrate ways that GBC is fostering faithfulness. And uh, I also want to encourage us that the Lord would direct your heart, your heart individually as he sees fit, where he sees fit, when he sees fit. Perhaps this is just a seed that's planted in your soul for a decade from now. If you're a student, student ministries age, thinking about what would God have for me to do to glorify him the most in this earth, in this short life that he's given me. So let's celebrate together and let's consider ways that we can together glorify God as we foster faithfulness. Let's pray. Oh God, our Father, we call you our Father because you have adopted us. You have called us out of darkness into your wonderful light, into your presence. You have given us everything that we need as a good Father does for life, for godliness, for being about your business, for living our life according to your plan and for glorifying you in a thousand different ways. Thank you for giving us opportunity to glorify you in trials, in blessings, in every station of life that you've called us to. And I pray that this uh, equipping hour would be part of your plan to equip the saints to be zealous for good works and to consider the good works towards children in foster care in Arizona. In Jesus' name, amen. So as a reminder, and maybe some of this will be new, but a foster child is a child younger than 18, who is a ward of the state. The state has been notified by someone somehow that there is a concern, a danger, uh, something that ought to be checked in with a child, perhaps a concerned teacher or neighbor, and the state comes checking. The state comes knocking a, a, a DCS worker investigates the concern. Not an allegation, not a, not a, not a legal matter, just, a, just checking in to check on the welfare of a child. And 
most of the time, those investigations are uh, unsubstantiated, where, okay, there was a concerned citizen, a, a concerned phone call that came in, but it was unsubstantiated. And uh, the DCS worker closes that case out. But in some cases, perhaps 20% of them, there is a serious concern where action needs to be taken. <clears throat> the state will, the DCS worker uh, is trained to do everything that they can to provide the resources that they can to that family, to that single mom, to that couple with children in the home. And oftentimes out of those 20%, that action is taken. They will provide resources. They will give uh, reminders, reprimands, and counsel that parent that they must take some specific actions to have their child remain in the home. And most parents are willing to take those actions to have their child remain in the home. Maybe it's a, a safety plan uh, in the home, maybe it is drug rehab that they submit to, and maybe it is having a responsible adult come and, and live in the home like a, a grandparent or an aunt or uncle who says, I will, I will make sure that these children are, are cared for, that they're taken care of so that they do not have to be removed from this home. So often there's a DCS plan for a family where the child stays in that home. But if that's not possible, if that's not likely, uh, if there is no other adult who can vouch for the safety of that child and DCS deems it a concern for the safety of this child, that the neglect is too, too much for them to walk away, they will remove that child. They'll remove that child and they'll ask the birth parent, often a single mother, who do you know, who's a kinship, a relative, that would be willing to consider taking in your daughter, your son, your three children? And they will <clears throat> give names of grandparents, aunts, uncles, kinship. And that is the first priority that the DCS would look into those kinship families to place those children out of mom's home or parents' home in with an uncle across on the, who lives on the other side of town or a grandparent. But if that doesn't happen, if that's not something that quickly happens, then DCS will look for a foster home a foster home to take in that child while DCS works to help that parent do what that parent needs to do to have their child reunified with them. So this is a, just a big picture of foster care. A lot of steps are taken before the dire need to have that child removed from the home and placed in a foster home. Or if there's not enough foster homes, which is an added crisis in Arizona to place that child or that sibling group in a group home, a group home with eight to 10 to 12 other boys or other girls, often separating siblings. So a lot of, I want to, I want to point out that a lot of steps are taken before a child is placed in a foster home. And that's just a big overall picture of foster care. But most of the cases are, we talk about abuse and neglect, and most of them are neglect. Some are physical abuse. Some are sexual abuse. But I wanted to pause out of love for you and in considering one of our verses we will this morning in Galatians 6.10 to do good to everyone, especially to those who are the household of faith. And I just wanted to speak as a brother in Christ to my brothers and sisters in Christ. 
about you and about your heart, about your life, about any abuse or neglect that you might have suffered as a child, as an adult. I've come across different people in the course of these last four years as I hear their stories and as I'm a foster care licensing worker, I get to talk to lots of families and help them get licensed to become a foster parent about the neglect or physical abuse or sexual abuse that they have suffered in their life and their desire to, to love children who are in uh, such a case of neglect, neglect or abuse to the point where they have to be removed from the home. So if you have carried that burden of neglect, that painful soul burden of abuse, physical or sexual, or neglect or abandonment of a parent, a father, a mother, and up to this point, it's just been you and the Lord, you bringing your heart to the Lord with that, for him to bear your burdens. I commend you for doing that. He, Jesus asks us to cast all of our cares upon him, to come to him, all who are weary, heavy laden. But he also commends the body to bear the burdens of the body. And I want to tell you that you have a body of believers right here at Grace Bible Church who love you because they love the Lord. There are pastors, deacons, small group leaders, and a myriad, a large number of mature, godly men and women who would be honored to carry that burden with you, to pray for you, for you to open, open up that uh, pain that you are bearing and have borne alone. So that's a side note, but it is definitely related to abuse and neglect. And I encourage you to not bear it alone anymore. God's given you the body of Christ at Grace Bible Church to bear that with you. Now, when it comes to foster care or really any mercy ministry to the world, for you serving outsiders, I wonder if you have a theology or some biblical truths to, to hang on when you think about how ought I to relate to outsiders. That's a term used in the Bible for those who are not of the household of faith. How do you think about your interaction with the world out there? Whether it's the homeless, whether it's foster children, whether it's those who have never heard the gospel in the mountains of Papua New Guinea. But there's three verses I want to point out very briefly. Colossians 4, 5 says this, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. And it's specifically about your speech towards outsiders, the opportunities you have to, to speak into the lives of those who are not stepping into the household of faith. So Colossians 4, 5. Another one is 1 Corinthians 16, 14. A succinct sentence that says, let everything you do be done in love. Let everything you do be done in love. And Galatians 6.10, which I mentioned earlier. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So putting those together in a mini theology, how do you think about your interaction towards others as a Christian? 
I would say, that, say it this way. Our manner of life towards outsiders should be wise, loving, and opportunistic as an overflow of the wise, loving, and opportunistic mindset already at work in the one another commands in your household, in the household of faith. Those three verses just help me with a framework of thinking, how do I think about relating to others who are outsiders, who are still in darkness, who are in need of the gospel, in need of God's salvation. So making the most of the time in Colossians 4, 5, other versions say redeeming the time, making the most of the opportunity, making the best use of the time. And the word time is there in that verse. And it's this making the best use or redeeming that is what God has done for us. It's what God has done for us in Galatians 4, 5. You can connect those two, Colossians 4, 5 and Galatians 4, 5, where Christ redeemed us. He bought us back. He bought us out of slavery and to himself. So I hope that's helpful just in thinking about how do I think about interacting with others? How do I think about my life as an insider in the household of God, uh, in his grip, in his hands, as I extend my hands to outsiders, to those who are outside the household of faith? So we've talked about foster care a little bit. Last year I presented, and it was really laying out steps of foster care. Today we're going to have an opportunity to hear from, uh, from Matthew Schneider, who just finished a long, a long journey of foster care to adoption. Looking forward to that. But what I want to do now is, is just talk about not only f- being a foster parent, but I want to talk about other ways, practical ways to support children in foster care. And like I said, we're going to begin with what is already being done. So celebrating the evidence of grace right now within the body of GBC. Well, first we have uh, an ongoing tradition at Grace Bible Church that Jenna Kelso leads which is our Christmas gift giving through CFC. That's another Christian agency, uh, foster care agency uh, that uh, my wife and I were a part of in our journey of fostering and adopting for uh, about 15 years in that journey. But CFC has the gift giving and, and I talked to Jenna about this and she was just full of encouragement uh, in a variety of ways. One is, one is that there was 100% participation from those who signed up. You take a card, you get a child's name, age, and, and maybe a gift idea, and you have a couple weeks to purchase that gift and bring it back to Grace Bible Church. That all happens uh, the Sunday before Thanksgiving so that there's time to actually get those gifts from here to Christian Family Care, from Christian Family Care into the household's that uh, are signed up for, but she was just really thankful. She's been doing this for a while. Uh, and she would, she said, I, I, I'm not uh, in big need for help, but if somebody wants to, to help, to participate, to send text reminders, um, to pack up gifts in a, in a car and, and drive them down to CFC, um, that would be great. But she was very thankful for the 100% participation that 20 families from Grace Bible Church participated, that there was, no, uh, there was no child left behind where she had to go purchase, purchase a gift uh, last minute. So thank you, Grace Bible Church, for doing that and for continuing. If you'd like to be a part of that, you can reach out to Jenna Kelso. But Grace Bible Church has also been 
uh, in other ministries. We have, we have a current foster, foster mom who is among us. And uh, I don't identify foster parents publicly uh, or their children. That's one of the no-nos. But we have a, a godly woman in this church who is, uh, who is loving a foster child. And I get to be her licensing worker. I get to make visits once a month and, and just see if she needs anything as I work for my agency, Arizona Faith and Families. And, and this body has come alongside her and has helped her. And I think that there's ways we can excel still more. In fact, there's a move she's making uh, at the end of this month from, uh, from a small apartment to across the way to another apartment. And it would be great to have a small army of strong young men or old men or women and men to, to serve her and to just have more, more uh, help than she could possibly uh, need or, or want. That would be a blessing. But that's coming up at the end of the month. If you'd like to, to get in contact with me, I can get you in contact with her. We can serve her that way. Grace Bible Church has also had foster parent college classes. Those are classes that one of the first steps you take as a foster parent or headed towards licensing is to take classes. There are five classes for three hours, at, uh, three hours once a week. So 15 hours of classes, 15 hours of online. But Grace Bible Church has been a host as I've been able to teach foster parent classes. We've had, uh, since my last talk last year, we've had three families go through foster parent college. They're all at different uh, states and in whether they're still discerning if they're going to become licensed or do respite only license, which is, which is being licensed but helping a foster family for a weekend or, or for a week or as needed, um, or if they're going to become foster families. So we'll see. But that's three families from, from this church that, that heard last year and then that stepped forward and said, I, I want to find out more information. And uh, I'm willing to take the classes and make that time commitment. So again, that's a 30-hour time commitment. It's a, a way that you could, you could consider stepping in. I found recently a statistic that, that half of the families that take this training, 30 hours, discern that this is not the ministry God's called them to. Or they make that decision somehow, some way. And, and about half move, move forward with foster care licensing. So in the last week, there's also been kinship. You may be a, you may be a kinship parent. I, didn't know, I don't even know who you are. You may have a niece or nephew who you're the legal guardian of or taking care of. And, uh, but I've, I've, I've known a few. I've been able to provide counsel to, to a husband and wife uh, who are wondering how they can help their um, relative in crisis with children and what are the steps that they can take. So there's counsel that's coming from Grace Bible Church. There's foster parent college. There's, uh, there's foster families currently at work. There's a recent adoption that we get to celebrate. So these are things to celebrate when we talk about the, the, uh, celebrating, fostering faithfulness. So what are some other foster care opportunities <clears throat> you can think about? I would like you to think about these. One is conduct your own interview, your own intake. You know, when you go to the ER, or they take some information about you and try to figure out who you need to see and how, how urgent it is or if, or if you can wait another three hours. Uh, conduct your own intake. Conduct your own interview. Matthew Schneider, Janelle, they are willing to talk to you about their experience. Ask them questions. The, the testimony he give, he's giving this morning is very brief. Uh, ask the Britons. Talk to Aaron. Uh, the Shelbournes have volunteered as a former foster family who have adopted so Travis and Sarah Shelbourne, uh, Vincent and Laura Lee, they've, they've volunteered to share their story. Theirs is not foster care. Theirs is, 
is adoption directly, uh, not foster to adopt. But there are, there are families in this church, and I could give you some more names, but, but you can consider just hearing their story. And if nothing else, celebrate a heart that, that was moved to open up their home. And maybe it was just for the blessing of fostering a child until that child reunified. Fostering a child until an uncle or aunt was found and the child went to live with that uh, kinship family or foster to adoption. So hear their story. Conduct your own intake. Next is what we've already talked about with the Christmas gift giving. Uh, consider that for your family. Consider, um, consider having so many volunteers that, that uh, we can increase our generosity towards the children, uh, foster children through CFC as, as you work with Jenna Kelso and be on the lookout for that. One, one blessing that Jenna Kelso said, just as a mature Christian, this is how a mature Christian thinks about these things. Not only is it a, a blessing to children that she'll probably never see, foster children, but uh, Matt and Jenna Kelso will say that it's a, it's a blessing to their own family. It has been as they, as they head towards Thanksgiving to, to take time to go purchase a gift or to even use a gift card that they have that they were given for their birthday or for graduation and, and take it and go spend it on a foster child. And, uh, and what a blessing it is for their family. That's a family who truly believes it's, it's more blessed to give than to receive. They believe the words of our Lord in Acts. So that's another way. A third way, uh, this may sound like self-promotion, but is through the agency I work with is Arizona Faith and Family. So consider, consider these ways that you could partner with me, with Arizona Faith and Families. And none of your partnership increases my pay. It, it just increases my joy to, to be able to work with and serve and come alongside families at Grace Bible Church, individuals at Grace Bible Church who want to consider how they might help. So here's one way. Foster a foster family. The foster mom here in our church, I think she would say, I have... Lots of people are willing to help. And, but yet if I asked her, who's the family that has adopted you or is fostering you through your foster care journey? Uh, I don't know if she would have a name. She might. But consider that. They say, you know, we can, we can foster a foster family. We can care for them. We can give them gift cards to go out on a date night. And, and offer free babysitting. Uh, my wife told me to, to say that one about four times. So I'm only going to say it three more times. But uh, that's, you know, just, just consider that way. Or just getting to know that foster family and saying, what are your needs? How can we bless you as a family? How can I, as an individual woman, as a single woman or as a single man, how can I help? What do you need? Let me know. Next is adopt a group home. Adopt a group home. Arizona Faith and Families is opening up a group home. It is on the other side of town, but it's a group home for Native American children. It's opening up in May. And the reason it's for Native American children is because there are laws that, that grant the tribe some authority to say yes or no to a foster family who's fostering a Native American child and the child is now ready to be adopted. The rights of the parents have been legally severed by a judge. The child is, is ready to be adopted. The foster family wants to adopt this child that's been in their home for a year and a half or two years and, and yet the Native American tribe sometimes says, no, we're still looking for a Native American family for this Native American child. So because of that fact, that factor, sometimes foster families uh, who do want to foster to adopt will say, 
we probably shouldn't foster Native American children if we think the Lord's leading us to foster to adopt. Thus, there's more need for uh, foster families for Native American children. Or uh, what we're endeavoring to do is a group home specifically for Native American children. So I can let you know of ways to consider adopting a group home. We have a beautiful home that God's provided and it's uh, an acre of land and we're refurbishing it and uh, looking forward to seeing how that develops. It's not a big part of my job. I'm the east side guy and I'm the foster care licensing guy with, with uh, specific families, but that's one way. Another way with Arizona Faith and Families is to help host an east side uh, foster care support group. So these are, it's a two hour commitment. We could have it at Grace Bible Church where foster families that I oversee come and they get biblical teaching about parenting, about uh, navigating these, these waters of foster care. They, we feed them a meal and we have volunteers care for their children. So Matt Kyle uh, here at Grace Bible Church has volunteered to, to lead um, a group it's probably a small group. I don't have a ton of families on the east side, but to lead some servants who will care for children, help them have a, a good time, uh, enjoy their evening while the parents get to have a little break, have a nice dinner, get to meet some other foster parents and receive some teaching from, from myself or from one of our elders uh, or from somebody with uh, a specialty in foster care. And then the other is just to use me as a reference. Uh, if you know somebody who's considering foster care, if you know of a, a church, uh, a solid Christian church who uh, would be willing to have a talk like this at their church, I would be glad to serve them in this way. And uh, so you could use me as a reference. David Britton. David at gbcaz.org. So I'm going to talk about one more, uh, one more way to consider, one more agency I came across in my research, which gives you the opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a foster child, yet you're not a foster parent. So that is through a hope and a future. azhope.com. I was able to speak with one of the directors at azhope.com. It's a nonprofit Christian ministry, and they have uh, some programs in place, including camps for foster children, and uh, just they're trying in different ways to put an adult in their life who will be consistent when a child gets moved from one foster home to another, or from one group home to another, to have a consistent uh, adult who is there for them, who is at least checking in with them a couple times a week. That's number one above uh, life. Sorry, the number five, mentor. The minimum of two, not contracts per month, contacts, my fault. Two contacts per month where they uh, meet with that child and, and uh, get to know him or her. But that starts through those first four steps. So... These notes will be on equipping our website, but Life 360 events, those are an eight hour event where they teach the children a skill and they uh, start building relationships. They, they have teaching and they have fun. So it's a fun day. Uh, sometimes there, there's about 50 kids at these events, 50 and about 15 or 20 of them are from group homes and they come, they, they get this teaching, uh, Christ is, is proclaimed to them. The love of Christ is shown to them and they get to have a good time. So Life 360 events, uh, you could sign up for that or just check out azhope.com on how to do that. There's also these next two I'm excited about uh, seeing what happens between now and next year. Will there be some Royal Kids Camp volunteers? Uh, Royal Kids Camp is in June. It's for ages 7 to 11. And that is, uh, I think, I believe it's a four-day camp. So it's a, it's a pretty big time commitment. 
but it's it's a zero financial commitment because uh, Arizona Hope in the Future pays for the camp. They pay for the kids to come to camp. They pay for the volunteers to come to camp. Uh, they do all the vetting and, and background check on, on the volunteers that come. And this is for ages 7 to 11. But AZ Hope in the Future was, was started by a man who, who said, well, what about these kids after their after, when, they, when they're 12, there's no more fun summer event for them. This is, for some of them, something they look forward to big time. And so they started TRAC, T-R-A-C. Uh, it's Teen Reach Adventure Camp. And that is a three-day camp for ages 12 to 15. I'd love to see uh, if we get some volunteers, some people who will take the, I believe it's eight hours of training and um, an interview and an application to be a part of that. Again, it's not, uh, it's not a money commitment, but it is a time commitment. And then they also have a young men's retreat for ages 15 to 19. So that could be aged out foster youth. These are young men who, who lived in the group home and uh, their hope of a foster home died in the group home. And they're now aged out. So they're Adults, and yet they still need uh, and would benefit by a godly person to build a relationship with them. So all these things are relationship building, and they all lead to a mentor if a, if a relationship naturally develops. So they don't they don't uh, cold match. They don't you don't just say I'm I'm willing to to uh, to meet one on one with a with a child and and uh, be his or her mentor. They, they first start with these events, the 360 events or the, the camp events, and that's where relationships are built organically and Christ is proclaimed, and then there's a mentor um, possibility. And even for that mentor, he, the, the gentleman shared with me about a, a, a man who's on the northwest side of town who matched up his, his uh, skills, his gifting, and his relationship perhaps at one of these um, camps with a foster boy in Queen Creek. And that's quite a drive. So they'll, they'll help pay for, uh, for gas reimbursement for that man to make his trip across town and uh, give gift cards to do fun events um, with that child. So there are some, we'll talk about a couple more uh, ways that you can consider caring for children in foster care, considering having a a real impact in their life. But right now I'm really excited to, to ask Matthew Schneider to come up and to just share his testimony of his family going into foster care, some of the hurdles, uh, some of the blessings, some of the trials, and um, all the way to adoption. So Matthew, thanks for coming. Thank you, David. Um, I too, this morning is coming, I'm coming to you this morning as a brother in Christ, first and foremost. Um, so just to quickly share with you a brief testimony. Here are five encounters with God's hand in our caring for orphans over the past uh, two and a half years. A glimpse of hurdles, surprises, areas of growth, our anchor of truth, and uh, the future. Um, not everything that can be said about our journey can be covered this morning. So if you have any questions, please reach out to Janelle and I for any questions or to hear more about these details that you're going to hear. The biggest hurdle, I would say, is our own heart. Was our own heart, is our own heart. Uh, the licensing classes prepared us, um, if anything, more than we thought they, they, they would. Um, and our licensing agent was really thorough but our hearts were the initial hurdles and continue to be. It all started in 2019 when we looked into adoption and thought going through foster care was a good way to do that. We then learned that the idea of foster care is to work toward reuniting the child with their parents. It wasn't until about a year later, my heart was changed. Being aware of the reality that there are thousands of orphans and I put here on my notes approximately 14,000, but I Googled David's reference to AZ Hope and they have a, a new number of uh, 18,000. 
Children without stability, without a home, without a family, without knowledge of the Savior. Our goal then became to foster, even with the aim to reunite the child with his, his or her parent. During the process, we worked through things like waiting patiently for the court to make decisions, and even more so, how and when we were going to meet with the biological mother to encourage her. And in, in addition to these auxiliary encouragements, we knew that we wanted to put the hope that repentance and faith brings in front of her. We were surprised about how often a DCS workers had to be replaced and the amount of coordinating that Janelle would have to do with the case aid drivers taking Joshua to and from his visitations. A more welcoming surprise, however, is when uh, adoption started to become the route that was gonna be taken. Uh, they had asked us multiple times during the process, are you willing, are you willing? And the answer to that question was yes. We got to experience the doctrine of adoption come to life in a new way. From taking care of an orphan to making him a son, Joshua eventually became a new person. The entire process grew us in more ways than I can count, and it still is. Even now, as I recall the experience and share the, the grace of God and his hand in all of this, other ways God grew us was Janelle had to work, Janelle and I had to work through differences in our own idea of what the relationship between us and the biological mother would look like during the process and then now after, even with our resolve to share the gospel with her. Joshua also had sisters in another state and we had to coordinate um, how we would go about uh, video calls so they could see him. He wasn't talking then. When working with the state, this is a, another way that we grown in the process. When working with the state instead of the church, we had to parent in a foreign way. The state and all of their training has their own idea of parenting when shepherding a child to think rightly about emotions and expressions. But in other instances during the journey, it, this also led to sweet conversations explaining to Uriah, Faith, and Lydia our other three children, the mutual blessing of taking care of orphans. This sharpened us in more ways than one. Our anchor of truth in this entire undertaking is the gospel. Children are a gift from the Lord and arrows that will one day be shot into the world. We are anchored in knowing that God cares for the fatherless and the fact that he would condescend to use us for this care is humbling and sobering as we have witnessed his hand in that work. And whether we fostered only or not, we were provided the opportunity to share Christ with a child who may never have gotten a picture of a God-fearing home. For now, our license is closed. Uh, you could ask me about that later. Nevertheless, we have a desire to foster again when the kids get a little older. In another sense, our journey will never end. Our life is forever changed, and we eagerly look forward to what God has in store for a family of now six. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your testimony of God's faithfulness. Just thinking about the things that God has taught me and uh, as a foster parent, as a foster to adopt parent. And uh, here's a few before we transition to some specific ways that you might step in besides foster parenting. But when somebody, when a family takes in a foster child, you, you welcome children to the dearest place on earth. And that's not because your home is so beautiful. It's because the dearest place on earth is God's church. Joshua gets to be a part of the dearest place on earth for the rest of his life, for the rest of his life. 
in the household, in the Schneider household, he better be. Um, when you take in a foster child, your children are reminded that the family is not centered around the child. The family is centered around Christ and on what is Christ's priority, on selfless loving, on giving to others, that it's not about you. It's about how can we glorify God together as a family. When you take in a foster child, you do risk loss. You do risk pain of having a child reunified that you were beginning to think, might this be my son, my daughter? And that is painful. But what's more profound than that pain is that God is greater than our hearts and that God has made you who are strong to bear with the weaknesses of children and to, to bear that suffering not alone, but with the body of Christ and with Christ himself. When you open up your home to a foster child, you do open the door to a possibility of adoption, even if you go in with gritted teeth saying, we believe, we've, we've looked at all the pros and cons, and should our family adopt or not, we are only going to foster, we are not going to foster to adopt, and... And yet, when you take in a child, things can change in your heart. And uh, you can go from one day to, there's no way that we're going to adopt, to uh, waking up the next morning and saying, there's no way that we will not adopt this child if, if uh, the rights of the parents are severed. So you do open that possibility just by stepping into foster care. When you open up your home to a foster child, you have a unique opportunity to bear with a child who might have some particular weaknesses. There may be some speech delays. There may be some physical delays. There may be some uh, difficulty coping with stress. And what, a better, what better place is there to have that child in than in the loving care of a Christ-centered home with parents who are seeking to honor God and do things God's way. And the last one is perhaps the most selfish or the most biblical. When you open up your home to a foster child, you give yourself an added opportunity for growth, for growth in holiness, for growth in selflessness, for growth in Christ-likeness. You imitate God himself who stepped in to the world to give himself for those who were not searching for him, were not seeking for him, and yet uh, rescued us and sent his only son to die for us. And there is a daily death in foster care that is a good and joyful thing to experience in dying daily, like the Apostle Paul says. But we've laid out some other ways to support foster care, and I want to lay out two more for you. The next is, is there a casa in the house? A casa. That is the court-appointed special advocate. Now, I don't usually ask for raising hands, but do we have any casas, court-appointed special advocates? Right here in the house, we have one. We have one who has experienced it in Illinois. All right. Thank you for. 
Thank you for sharing. So it was supposed to be a rhetorical question. I didn't think there would be a CASA in the House uh, because a CASA is a court appointed special advocate, and, and this is uh, this does require training. It does require fingerprint check. It does require about 10 to 15 hours a month, but that's much less of a commitment than 24/7 as a foster parent. But 10 to 15 hours a month where you are trained to be the champion for the child. You're focused on that child, but you also have a voice with the judge. And you also have access to all of that child's information, just like a DCS uh, worker, or just like a guardian ad litem, a lawyer. You, you get that information, and you, you get a few children that you, uh, you have an age range that, that they work out, what, what might be a right age range for you to to step into a foster care situation and, and make sure that this child has what they need and that right decisions are being made for this child. So this is a, this is a great uh, opportunity uh, for, for men and women and something that you might consider. You don't have to have a law degree. You don't have to have a college degree. Uh, you do have to be able to, to uh, document your visits and, and they teach you how to document things for the court, but you make recommendations to the judge. The judge hears your voice more than the judge hears the voice of a foster parent for what's best for the child. You build a relationship with the child. Uh, when your time is done, when that child's finally moved to permanence, either to reunification or to uh, adoption, then your case is closed as a, a CASA, but You've established a relationship with this child. And if you were willing, and the child was willing, to continue to have a relationship, there's another way that you can have a lifetime influence in a child. So I, for this talk, I went to a 45-minute orientation about what a CASA is in Arizona. And you can go to uh, the website maricopacasa.org. And again, these notes will be on the equipping hour website. They're not just, it's not just info of what we talked about, but it's actual phone numbers and people that you can contact, places you can go to uh, consider taking the next step. But it could be worth just a 45 minute uh, orientation for you. And the next is another CFC program, uh, Christian Family Care, which is the Strong F Families Program led by Debbie Baker. So this is really preventative care. This is stepping into a crisis situation with a family that's about to have their child removed into foster care. But some of them, a small percentage, make a 30-day uh, volunteer, uh, volunteer agreement where they say, please help me for 30 days, get my life in order, uh, take my child, and, and I voluntarily, voluntarily allow a family to take my child, and if I work on these things, uh, correct these things in my household in the next 30 days, uh, I, I can better be equipped to take my child back into my home. So Debbie Baker leads this, and there's uh, two ways that you can serve in this way. This One is to be a family friend, just to be a mentor to, to this family who has not yet had their child removed by the state, but is on the verge. You could be a family friend. Uh, you could be a mentor to oftentimes it is a single mom or to a couple in crisis. And that could be as, as distant as texting and encouraging, starting, starting slowly on building a relationship uh, to, to visiting, to praying for, to, to uh, finding ways to, to encourage that, that mom to take the steps that she needs to, to be healthy and ready to take her child back. So you can be a family friend, or it's called the Strong Family Program because uh, some families will say, well, we can do foster care for 30 days. It's kind of like, you know, some men, like, I can go without dessert for 30 days. That's it. 30 days over the course of my life. I'll do it. So, uh, <laughs> so it, it is a 30-day commitment uh, if you become a strong family. And um, 
you know, it's, it's, you're, you're giving selflessly, you're not paid for it, you don't have to pay for training, um, but you take a lot of the steps that a foster parent already takes, you're just doing it uh, at no, no real benefit to you. It's, it's completely selfless. There's no reimbursement from the state for you. Uh, so that's another way. And then uh, the last, again, it sounds like self-promotion, but it's not, is, is please follow up with me if you'd like. We've talked about a lot of things. Uh, and if you want to talk about any one of them in particular, I'd be glad to talk with you through it. My pay does not increase with the number of foster families I get. And uh, I just really want to grow in encouraging others to consider helping out in some way where for most of my life it's been, well, this is what we've done, so this is the way, foster care. But, um, but I want to encourage you in the way that God has equipped you. And so have an intake with me or let's, let's schedule one. I don't know what God would have for, for you to do, but I want to serve you in that way if you'd like. So these are, these are ways to serve that we've talked about. I do encourage you to get that equipping hour resource, to download that, to print it, to maybe consider one of those ministries to pray for, to ponder, to have conversations about will we step in or not. And I'd like to give a prayer and a benediction to you as we close. So Lord, Lord, you have appointed the time, the season, the place where we are. You have set before us your unfathomable grace in Christ. And as we daily consider the treasure of knowing Christ and of being found in him, not having a righteousness of our own, but the righteousness of Christ through adoption. Would you cause us to increase and abound in love for one another in this body and for all, all for your glory. In Jesus' name, I pray. And my benediction is from he the end of Hebrews 13, 20. Grace Bible Church, may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen? Amen. Dismissed. Thank you.